Does Genesis chapter 6, verse 13 support the notion that the flood was regional instead of global? That's the question that I'm going to answer today in this video. This is actually the first video in a series that I'm doing on the flood regarding arguments inspiring philosophy made for a regional flood. Not that long ago, inspiring philosophy made a video titled Noah's Flood, Global or Regional? In that video, inspiring philosophy argues for a regional flood and against a global flood. In this series, I'm going to respond to the arguments he made in that video. And in doing so, I'm going to demonstrate that the notion of a regional flood is not supported by Scripture. I believe Scripture teaches very clearly that the flood was a global event. And I honestly think it's very sad that some Christians have bought into the idea of a local or regional flood. The first point inspiring philosophy raises in favor of a regional flood theory is in reference to Genesis chapter 6, verse 13, which states, And God said unto Noah, The end of all flesh is come before me, for the earth is filled with violence through them, and behold, I will destroy them with the earth. Inspiring philosophy argues that this verse is hyperbolic, since it's not true that God literally made an end of all flesh, since all the creatures on the ark and all the sea creatures survived. So since that's the case, the phrase all flesh in this verse can't be taken literally, right? And naturally, that leaves room for the possibility of a regional flood, right? Actually, no, it doesn't. Let me explain why. When it comes to exegeting Bible verses, it's very important to read them in context. I think anyone who is familiar with the flood account knows that God wasn't referring to Noah or his family or any of the animals on the ark when he said all flesh in this verse, since it's made very clear in the flood account that Noah and his family and the animals brought onto the ark would be saved. Genesis chapter 7 verses 1 through 2 says, And the Lord said unto Noah, Come thou and all thy house into the ark, for thee have I seen righteous before me in this generation. Of every clean beast thou shalt take to thee by sevens, the male and his female, and of beasts that are not clean by two, the male and his female. So of course all of the creatures on the ark are excluded from the phrase all flesh in chapter 6 verse 13. But it doesn't follow from that that it's hyperbolic and not literal, because the author of Genesis actually clarifies what is meant by all flesh within the context of the flood account. To start with, let's refer back to Genesis chapter 6, verse 13, which is the same passage inspiring philosophy used to make his argument. But when you read the passage in context, it's very easy to see how it actually contradicts his argument. Let's read it again. Genesis chapter 6, verse 13. And God said unto Noah, The end of all flesh is come before me, for the earth is filled with violence through them, and behold, I will destroy them with the earth. Now if you read carefully, you'll notice that the author tells us in the same verse who all flesh refers to. The end of all flesh is come before me, for the earth is filled with violence through them. Who is them? The flesh that's committing violence. The corrupt flesh that Genesis chapter 6 verse 12 talks about. And God looked upon the earth, and behold, it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted his way upon the earth. So when you read Genesis chapter 6 verse 13 closely, and refer back to Genesis chapter 6 verse 12, it's made very clear that the author tells us precisely what all flesh refers to. It refers to all of the corrupt flesh. Now someone might object to this rendering by bringing up the sea creatures just like inspiring philosophy did. So are the sea creatures also excluded from the phrase all flesh in Genesis chapter 6 verse 13? It would seem so. Let's look at Genesis chapter 7 verses 21 through 22, which also clarifies what all flesh refers to in the flood account. Genesis chapter 7 verses 21 through 22 says, And all flesh died that moved upon the earth, both of fowl and of cattle and of beast, and of every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth, and every man all in whose nostrils was the breath of life, of all that was in the dry land, died. So within this context, it is true that the phrase all flesh doesn't literally refer to all flesh as in every human being and animal that was alive. But based on the very explicit reading of Genesis chapter 7 verses 21 through 22, it does refer to all flesh that was left on the earth, specifically all flesh that was in the dry land. That's actually what earth refers to in this context. It refers to the dry land and not the earth as a whole. A reference for that interpretation is Genesis chapter 1 verse 10 which says, 
And God called the dry land earth, and the gathering together of the waters called he seas. And God saw that it was good. In the Bible, earth doesn't always refer to the globe. Sometimes it just refers to the dry land. So Genesis chapter 7, verses 21 through 22, tells us that the phrase all flesh refers to all flesh that was in the dry land, all in whose nostrils was the breath of life. That's the flesh that was brought to an end. So the phrase all flesh in Genesis chapter 6, verse 13 is literal, but it's referring to all the corrupt flesh that was left on the earth, the dry land, not the creatures in the seas or those that were on the ark. Now that we've done a thorough examination of Genesis chapter 6, verse 13, and cross-referenced it with other related verses, I think we can safely conclude that it most certainly is not hyperbolic. Inspiring philosophy got it wrong. Genesis chapter 6, verse 13 doesn't at all imply that the flood was regional and not global. But the conclusion that the flood was global isn't based on one verse alone. It's based on the entirety of the flood account. And by the end of this series, if not before, it's going to become very clear that the conclusion that the flood was global is inescapable.